and where we need to put our money in improving healthcare in the country. And I'm delighted to be joined by someone who's had a very harrowing experience at the hands of our healthcare system here in Ghana, and also will be joined by a medical practitioner, a neurosurgeon who's been in this for a while and wants to get a lot off his chest about what's wrong with our healthcare system and what we need to do to fix it. Welcome. We are live here on Channel 361 on your DSTV, also live uh, on Facebook at GH1 TV. Your views and comments are definitely welcome. Let me introduce you to my guest uh, tonight. Um, she is Cordelia Ama Selobe. You may have realized in the last uh, month or two, uh, there was some uh, talk about a young, bubbly 13-year-old boy who was... Uh, in need of a surgery that required some funding. So some crowdfunding was done to support him. Uh, that was done, and a lot, a lot of people were excited that this was a good time that we were helping someone genuinely who was in need. Turns out that we lost him after the operation. Tonight, we'll get a full story. We will appreciate what happened, and some of the details just might shock you. Cordelia, good evening to you. Good evening, Francis. Thank you for making time in this very difficult moment to join us. Um, I would want you to help us appreciate the full picture. So, um, Michael Kofi Kekeli Siama yeah. was your son. Yeah. It's painful to use that adjective or the verb was because this is a boy that we saw grow full of life, so wonderful, so 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 much of a fighter, someone who wants the best for everybody. How did we come to lose him? What happened? Talk me through what happened. Because up until the beginning of this year, Michael was okay. What happened? Well, Michael <coughs> had um, been complaining of headaches. Um, no headaches that come and go. Um, from I think it started beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. And you give him like a painkiller mm -hmm. and it will go away. Mm -hmm. And then he would live his normal life. Everything was okay. Up until um, towards the end of last year. And we realized the headaches started becoming more and more consistent. And so it sort of caught us um, to get um, interested in why these headaches were um, ke just kept coming. Yeah, yeah. were recurrent. And so we, we went to the hospital. I took him to the hospital. Actually, a day before his 13th birthday on 30th November last year, we went to the hospital. And um, I remember we ran a, a, a series of tests, and the doctor said that he had tonsillitis. And so I remember I asked the doctor whether this could cause very severe headaches. And the doctor said, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. So I said, great, what do we do about it? Is it that bad? Because I know sometimes they need, they require surgery, you know. And he said, no, we haven't gotten there yet. We'll give him antibiotics and monitor. Mm -hmm. And then they did give him antibiotics and medication. We went home. He was okay for a bit up until beginning of this year. It started again and it started getting worse. So I remember somewhere in February around 2 a.m., my son walked into my room and said, mommy, I don't feel too well. I was really... 2 a.m. I was sleeping, you know, in the middle of sleep. So I hadn't even properly woken up. And then he was sitting at the bed and said, Mommy, Mommy, I don't feel well. I said, Kofi, can we wait till morning? And then we go to us. He said, no, I can feel something moving in my head. So just when I was about to get out of bed, he started throwing up. Wow. I didn't think anything of it. We rushed him to the hospital. Um, and then again, they said he had a bacterial infection. You know, and was, this was a different hospital because we wanted the closest, considering yeah. how, much pain, how, how much pain he was in. And then we came back home. He started going back to school. You'd be, in, and you'd be there, and then the, his school authorities would call and say, we've had to move Michael out of class. He's complaining of headaches. He needs to take off his mask. And so what the headmistress would do is take, off his, take him into her office. You take off his mask, and you lay down. He was missing a lot of class. Wow. And so it started, it started raising, uh, like, um, uh, concern. Mm -hmm. So again, then I had to speak to a pediatrician this time. And I said, you know what? This is what is happening. I'm tired of them saying this and that and this. And then he said, then we need to do, like, a thorough check. So bring him in and let's start. So we'll start from the eye. And he was already wearing glasses. And so we went to the hospital 
and um, we saw the ophthalmologist they ran some tests and realized he had a problem what they call i think a refractive error with one of his eye yeah and so we had to change the lens for him and they said that that could cause severe headaches as well so we changed the lens and they told me if he complains of headache after that then you need to bring him back then we need to go a step further because then it means that it's not the eye and it's something more than that so for a week he was okay he was he was fine and then I remember he said something to me within that week that um, <clears throat> his uncle had picked him up from school. And as he was walking to the car, he fell. And I was wondering, I asked, was this something that tripped? He said, no, he just fell. At the time, I didn't, mobility. At the time I didn't know there was anything in his head. We didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. So we just, you know, brushed it off. And then, um, so when, after the fall, like a day or two after, then he started complaining of headaches again. So when I called the doctor, he said to his pediatrician, he says, you need to come in again. Now we need to run a CT scan. If we don't find anything, then we can go further to have an MRI done. So I went on the 23rd of March. Um, that was a Tuesday. We went to run a CT scan. And when we ran the CT scan, um, they came back to me to say that we needed to run a further CT scan with contrast. That helps the radiologist see things clearly. And um, I asked why. And then they said, the radiologist had seen something he wasn't sure of, and he needed to be sure of what he was seeing. And yeah. so that started scaring me. I started getting, you know, anxious. And finally, the re results came, and then they diagnosed him of, well, what, I won't say diagnosed him. What they thought they saw mm -hmm. was a Rathke cleft cyst, which, um, if you'd ask around, shouldn't be so much of a big deal to treat. Yeah. Um, and then they asked us to go to, so the pediatrician had called Kolebu to book for us to come on that Thursday, which would have been 25th March, and asked us to go and run some tests on Wednesday. Yeah. So on Wednesday, on our way to run the test, he started throwing up again in the car. And then I asked him if we could go, if he could go in to run those tests. He said, mommy, I can. Let me just, let me just rest a bit because he was feeling dizzy. And then we went in to run the tests. I went, I went to the bank, which is not too far from where we ran the test. And as I was in the bank, I knew he had his phone. So I said, if there's anything, just call me. But I don't know, there was something that was just telling me to go back to the car to check up on him. And when I went to the car, he was throwing up. It was so bad, like he was helpless. And I was scared. So I called the doctor. He said, you need to rush to the hospital now. And... That was police hospital that was seeing him. We yeah. had to rush there from East Legon to police hospital. And when I got there, his pediatrician had already gotten an ambulance and they were working on the documents for us to rush there. Because he said when he spoke to the neurologist, they said once the, sh the, th the vomit was shooting out, then it means that there was intracranial pressure mm -hmm. in his brain. Yeah. So then they needed to have an emergency procedure. So I remember we got to Kolebu. You just don't get to Kolebu and get to see the neurologist. You have to go through. So I got, we got to Kolebu, the emergency center, and then... When we got there, the doctors asked me, um, who referred you here? And I said, we're referred from police hospital. So we gave them the referral notes they the read through yeah. and everything. And they said, well, you can see. And as they were saying, there were just chairs. There was no bed. And some people were in the chairs receiving drip and medication and all of that. But they said because he had a problem with the brain, there was no way they could have put him in a chair. Yeah. And so the only... way they would allow him to stay is if the ambulance could leave the stretcher and i tend to look at the ambulance driver and ask him would you please leave your stretcher he said i don't have a problem madam just i'll come for it tomorrow just you know i'll leave it for you i said are you sure you're not going to get into trouble he said madam it doesn't matter just take it god bless him so that was how he got in there that was around 11. that's how he got a stretcher to lay on a stretcher to lay on and he so was in the there. absence of that stretcher from the ambulance? They would have returned us. There were ambulances over there that we saw. And my brother would say one of them had come even from Jomoro. Yeah. That was turned away because there was no space. You know, people were, there were ambulances waiting. We were not the only people. But they had to be turned away because there was no space. There was no bed. There was no bed. You know, and some people had come in in critical condition like Michael. Yeah. And there's no way they can put them in a chair to sit, to receive medication or first aid. You know, and so we were somewhat, by the grace of God, lucky. Okay. And then... Um, okay. Um, I've just been saying that we have to go for a quick break now. So we'll go for a quick break. When we return, we'll continue. And, and already, 
the details emerging suggest that there are, there are some difficulties in even getting a, a place for a young person who is in need of medical care. So, quick break, we'll be back. You're watching State of Affairs here on GH1 Television. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Responsibly, not for sale to persons under 18 years of age, nor recommended for pregnant women. Everyone needs something. Sometimes, they become person you wish you can just get a grip as soon as possible. And you will get caught with so many questions of the how, where, and when. No need to bother any longer. My name, Mama Preggy. I am here to solve all your urgent needs. Check my slide. Visit my website now at www.mamapregimarket.com and you will find all range of products, food items, mother care, and baby items that will just suit what you need to buy or sell with a simple click. Call us on 030-2549-813 or 050-4709-463. Download the app on Google Play Store and Apple Store and Mama Preggy Delivery will be at your doorstep with your orders. Mama Preggy, a time limit. It's an exciting time to join Surfline. We've changed our prices in your favor with bigger and better bundles. Also, if you decide to get a new device, we give you 50 gigabytes free data. Alomo bites. If you do me no echini, and that's why you're authentic. Anio, any entrevue. Alomo, alomo, alomo. Alomo, alomo ya. Mumbra ma yenti yemi ya. Me di a dream park where she am alomo. Alomo ya. Show me alomo now she sing gra. Ya ko no say ya. Ya ya no say ya. Ya ko no say ya. A lomo betes a di twenty years the time repa kroji. Numu nyansem one tomani pa wuni fie duwachi and sesa pimfonum. FDI fufu seje di nkra tu imaji atum seye. A lomo authentically African. Nothing wakes me up better than a cup of cowbell coffee. Delicious coffee aroma. Mmm. How can you forget your lines again? I'm sorry, sir, just that it tastes really good. Cowbell coffee! Enjoy the delicious creamy coffee taste of three in one cowbell coffee. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA.
Thanks for staying with us. You're watching State of Affairs here on GH1 Television. We're talking about the state of our healthcare system in the country. And um, the, the, the case in point is um, the, the story of a mother who's lost the 13-year-old son um, through two medical procedures and the outcome. And she's been magnanimous to share her story with us tonight. Um, Ama, before the break, you... were telling us about reaching the Kolebu teaching hospital, the neuro emergency, the emergency. emergency okay. unit. And you were told that there was no bed at the time? No, there was no bed. And that the ambulance had to give the stretcher? That's or the only they, way they, they would turn you away? Yeah, because he had come in with a brain um, problem and there was no way they could have put him in a chair. Yeah. So if they didn't leave the stretcher, then there was nothing they could do. We would have to go back home. And when I say go back home, because there was there would have been nowhere else for us to go, because yeah. that was the referral center. That's where the new neurologist are. Um, but we got there around 11 in the morning, and by 3 p.m. they had found a bed for us in the center, emergency accident and emergency area. And so he, they moved him onto the bed from the stretcher. Um, we had to wait for another three hours because um, like the that was a theater day for the neurologist and so later that day they came in one of them came to check up on him and between 6 and around between 6 to 10 30 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, this doctor is trying to find a way to get a bed in the neurosurgical ward for Michael and I mean I could tell how frustrated he was and um, so what we got there, he said, um, finally, he was able to get us space. And he even said, it's likely he might go into theater tonight. I didn't understand what he was talking about. But initially, I told him, if they couldn't find a bed space for him, could we just take him home? And then he said, if you could see what was happening in your son's head, the last place you'd want to be is home. As a matter of fact, he said they were not even going to allow me to move out of the hospital with him because he needed an emergency um, procedure. Ser yeah, surgery. So that Wednesday night, from the time we got there, he had been on painkillers up until Thursday, 25th March where um, the doctors, now the doctors had come as a team to go around. Ha they have their ward rounds. They come and see the patient. So they saw him, and then um, they would ask me, can, 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 can your son see, can, can your son talk? And then I asked one of them why they were asking those questions. And he said to me that the size of the tumor in his head mm -hmm. um, and where it's sitting should have destroyed some nerves over there. That would have made it impossible for him to see or to talk wow but at a point he was okay i mean yes he was complaining of double vision mm -hmm. you know but it wasn't that bad because when he can see you when you're talking to him so then they said, now, the, 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 what they are going to do? So um, Dr. Pia, who is a um, neurosurgeon, also came. He was, one who gave me the, was to ease the pressure in his brain because the tumor was sitting in the middle of the brain okay. um, where the passage of the CSF fluid was supposed to go into the spinal area. And so what it had done was to block the passage. So it has to mean the cerebrospinal fluid? Yeah, yes. Okay. So that fluid has been accumulating. If they look at the size of the tumor, it's probably been sitting there for two years. Wow. So for two years, this fluid has been accumulating in his head and it's getting worse, obviously. So that is what is causing the throwing up and the double vision and so they need to ease the pressure in his brain so he explained what the process was mm -hmm. by um, going in there to put a tube called a shunt they bypass the brain and fix it in there it goes through the face and comes and and then they leave it into the lower abdominal cavity so it, it drains the fluid over there and they, they will tell you that the body naturally absorbs it it's, it's like the safest place for the CSF fluid to go. Okay. And this tube was going to remain in him for life. Um, so I remember I asked, if you're going to take out the tumor, that means the passage will be free. So why does it have to be in him for life? And he explained that um, it's because where they fix the tube, it, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't medically make sense to go back in there to take out a tube okay. that could serve a purpose, just should in case even the tube. So the kind of tumor he had is mm -hmm. called a craniopharyngioma, which doctors will tell you is a very um, difficult tumor to treat because it can wreak here. Um, the thing is, even though it's benign, which is not cancerous, it acts like a cancerous tumor because of how aggressively it tends to grow or invade the area. In medical terms so um, 
we went for the first surgery yeah. um before went into theater the lead doctor who um he was who michael had been assigned to was dr abdallah hadi mohammed abdallah and dr abdallah came in just before he was wheeled into theater to meet up with michael because abdallah had had so many calls from different places oh yeah and so he wanted to see who this little boy was that had so many doctors from all over calling him and um they built some sort of relationship he, they spoke he he calmed michael down mm -hmm. and then they went into theater so they came back out um they went out into theater around 6 p.m on thursday he came out around 11 p.m from icu mm -hmm. back in, into the ward and um he was okay he was fine he was okay <laughs> So the first said, surgery was for the tube. The for second, the tube. The, the second was for what? To take out the tumor. The tumor. Was yes. that also done successfully? It was so successful. Okay. And, and you, know, you know, as they went in there, they took a sample of the tumor to, for, for us to test at the lab, mm -hmm. just to make sure it wasn't cancerous, and to also see how much of the tumor had been taken out. Yeah. And um, we got those results on Monday. The Monday after Michael passed. And I, I couldn't understand the terms. So I had to take a picture and send it to Abdallah. He said, oh, no. Abdallah was so broken. He says because they had taken almost everything out. It was just left with a little bit of it. So he would have just needed like a few sessions of radiotherapy. You to know, clear it out. To clear it out. Okay. So now take me to the two surgeries done. Um, when the second surgery was done, brought out to ICU, were told that, Everything was successful. Doctors came out and were excited. They told you, look, it's one of the best that they've ever seen. Uh, Both done. doctors. Both um, doctors. Francis, because, um, so they went through the nose to take out the tumor. Yeah. And so um, in going through the nose, you need a team of ENT. They are the specialists when, specialist when it comes to the nose and yeah. ear and stuff. And so they had to help the neurosurgeons get into the brain from the nose. Mm -hmm. So it was a team of doctors. That, that made it possible. That made, and they both confirmed that surgery was successful. So that was done. He was supposed to be at the ICU for how many days? To be honest, um, if, if we're supposed to say how long anybody is supposed to be in the ICU after a major surgery like that, it should be like for a week. Yeah. You know? But he was in the surgery, he was in the ICU for less than 24 hours because he went into theater um, Tuesday at 9 a.m. And he had, he had been um, wheeled into ICU at um, around 5.30 p.m. In the evening. In the evening. By 10 a.m. he was in the ward. And the reason was? Somebody else had to use the bed. There's just four beds in ICU beds in Kolibu. Wait, one, two, three, four. Four. Two four on beds. your left, two on your right. Four beds. And one is a, supposed to be assigned to the neurosurgical or the neuroscience unit. And so you have a lot of cases. Um, Francis, there were a lot of people who were waiting, who equally had pressing um, issues yeah. that needed to be attended to. There's no way I can say forget about those people and leave my son on the bed. You see, it's easy for us to draw the line and say the doctors killed my son. It's not the doctors that killed my son. They are just, there's just one bed for neuroscience unit. There are people who have... I was there when somebody had been brought in, right? The person who was going into theater after Michael had come out was an accident person who had had trauma and was in coma. And had to be operated on. So how do you say that they should keep your son on the bed and forget about this person? Who's in coma? Yes. Okay. So it was moved from the ICU. And you're saying that the entire unit has four beds. The Technically unit. one bed for the unit. One. The other three is brought in as and when there are some more cases from right. other units. Right. right. Four beds. Four beds. Four beds. And I, I can't count the number of people that are on the ward who need to go into surgery. Forget about the ward. I can't count the number of people who are on waiting list, who have been waiting for a year or two. Let me tell you something. Doctors who come in, right, who come to see uh, and hear our, our case, like a friend is there and knows a doctor who says, oh, come and check out my, my friend and his son. Come and ask, when did you get into Kolibu? I told them we got in on Wednesday and you had a surgery on Thursday. That doesn't happen. These are medical doctors telling us that it doesn't happen. There must be some sort of favor around us. It doesn't happen. We went in on Wednesday. We had a bed on Wednesday. We, were, um, we had a uh, first surgery on Thursday. 
you know, so at a point after the first surgery, even had, um, Dr. Abdallah said he wanted to discharge her. So we go home. When it's time for the next. Next surgery we come. Mike told him he doesn't want to go home because he's not sure if he when we are about to come back, it'll be a bed space. He just wanted to, to deal with the second surgery to take out the his stay at the ward and the news of his passing. He was being I mean the doctors would do what they ought to do, yeah. have checked his vitals around. So when he came out of the ward, um I realized his urine was quite so they would say that it's not concentrated. So yeah. they had to run kidney functioning tests morning and evening. You know, and they were running all those tests and giving all the medication. But now we needed to give him a lot of water because he was dehydrated and it was difficult because he had just come from surgery, he was weak, and even 10 mils, for him to drink just 10 mils of water was a problem. Meanwhile, I was told I had to give him about 10 liters of water a day. What? So I wasn't sleeping. Yeah, I wasn't. I mean, Dr. Banton told me that it's that necessary, that you can't afford for him to be de dehydrated. And so I wasn't sleeping throughout the night, which is my job, of course, as mm -hmm. his mother. I don't have any problem about that. I mean, because it was, it was something that happened after the surgery. So um, on Wednesday night, apparently his temperature was spiking. Thursday morning, Dr. Abdallah came and said he's seen a spike in temperature. It's not a good sign because then that means an infection is taking place in the brain. And so we needed to get some medication. Mm -hmm. And immediately, without hesitation, he said, I'm going to get you, uh, write you one of the best antibiotics. In fact, the best we have in the country. And that should solve the, the infection. Problem. So I didn't even know what we were dealing with because I'm sure they themselves didn't know and wanted to run tests. So um, we got the medication, which was around 4,000 CDs mm -hmm. for antibiotics. 4,000 Ghana CDs? Yes. Um, Meronem and vancomycin. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and, and then um, his temperature started going down. So that evening, they asked us to take him to the x-ray because the, to run a scan because they wanted to see what was happening in his head post-op, po after surgery. Yeah. And we took him from um we had to push him on the bed from the neuroscience center to the ct scan area which i have been saying in my interviews that i would say it's from like togo embassy in cantonments to around police hospital from that's the like, distance that's like half a kilometer yeah it's 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 like because you're going downstairs and you now feel and move from one area to another and there's somebody who's had an operation there is no ct scan in the whole surgical building the only thing that is there's is the beds and the theaters there's no ct scan there's no mri and so you have to move to another department to go and run those tests yes yes and, and when you got there with all the bumps in pushing this um pushing your child on this on the stretcher in essence so I got there, um, so I, myself and um, Dr. Carl Nutruga mm -hmm. got there. He got there ahead of me and I got there. We got there ahead of um, my sister-in-law who had to wheel him with a nurse to bring him just to make sure that everything was okay. So when he comes, he just take him in so we don't waste time. Yeah. And when I got there, I could see frustration on Dr. Carl's face. So I asked him, I said, why? He said, they are saying they can't run the scan. And I asked why. And then he says, he doesn't know. Um, the guy just says he can't run the scan. So... As I'm sitting there, I could tell another woman who was there who was frustrated. And she was telling them that I am also a doctor. I'm a doctor. And I think she had brought a patient that needed a, a scan. And yeah. they were frustrating her as well. So Carl was just calm and asked the guy who ran the scan when he came out, was trying to talk to him. Excuse me. The guy says, no, no, no. I don't want to talk to you. I'm not, I, you can't, I don't want to talk to you. That was his demeanor. I don't want to talk to you. I don't have anything to do with you. I don't have anything to do with that. I'm not listening. In fact, he said, I'm not listening. You know, the woman at the reception was awful, horrible. So as we are there, Carl doesn't know what to do. He just shakes his head and places a call to one of the neurosurgeons, Dr. Um, Banton. Dr. Banton calls the head of that scan x-ray place. And then the person sent, the head sent somebody to now come and run the scan. Before it was done? Before it was done. So without the calls, this there would not nothing, happen? It wouldn't have happened. They were so clear that they were not going to do it. They were so clear about it. And this is, this is a scan that we're paying for. So after Michael's first surgery, we took him from Kolebu to Laboni to go and run an, an MRI at Urake because of some of these things. 
So if he could move, why not? But he had to, the second surgery was a major. Yeah. So he I can't mean, move him. you can't just move him. You would have to go in an ambulance. We were trying to get an ambulance to no end. Okay. So that test was also done. Sent back. Sent back. To the ward. Yes. Then what happened? So um, Dr. Banson said there was just, there was just a, a slight brain bleed, which is, which is normal. Um, so I asked her, I was, you know, when, you, when this, you hear those things, you get scared. And she's like, no, 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 the, the body has a way of absorbing it, so that's fine. And then the doctors, I got there, when they got the report, I didn't understand the report. I just saw all of them giving each other high five and, you know, sh like smiling. So I was asking, what's going on? And they, they said um, they had taken out almost everything. As a matter of fact, they can't even see anything left there. Most likely, he won't need radiotherapy. So I was jumping. I was excited. excited. So, um, because the radiotherapy was going to be another phase on its own. Yeah. So then, that was Thursday night. We pulled through Thursday night. So Friday, he was okay. In the morning, um, the specialist that we assigned to him, the endocrinologist, who is a specialist when it comes to hormones, came, Dr. Michael came to speak to him. And because they shared the same name, it was very nice and everything. And then he placed the stethoscope like checking his chest and everything and went to the back, the lower back area and said, we need to, we need to run an x-ray. Mm -hmm. You can hear there's some fluid in there. He wants to make sure it is what it is or it's not. So they know what they are doing. I said, okay. And then they, they gave me the report for the x-ray in the afternoon. So I had gone to the, that was also at another place. Yeah. Now I had to move him again. But then the doctors had said, no, at that point, they needed to start administering the blood thinning medication, which is Clexane. So I went to buy it. My little sister rushed upstairs to give it to the, um, the, my in-law who was by him, mm -hmm. and they administered it. Because they said there was no way they were going to move him without giving him that um, medication. medication. And he was already wearing the Tet stockings on his leg, which was supposed to also aid circulation. He was wearing that even before he went into the second surgery. So they, um, so I got to the X-ray and I called my sister and I said, they said we should bring him around three at three o'clock. So they were preparing and everything and they brought him. Now, this is the accident and emergency where a lot of people are seeking treatment. There's a lot of infection in the air. Yeah. This is somebody who has come from a brain surgery yeah. and obviously cannot put on a mask. So he is there in the hallway and for more than an hour, you see people trickling in and coming out and and nobody's attending to him so i had to get i went i went bonkers i just went in there and told them listen my son is in the hallway with you gave us a time so why you why is he still there you know and then they started calming me down and said oh then he'll be the next before they moved him in there so then we went to we had the x-ray and everything done we went back upstairs to the neurosurgical ward and then um, when we got to the ward, he said he wanted to rest a bit. So we let him rest a bit. And mm -hmm. then um, I went back. I went to the waiting area because I was dizzy. And my sister-in-law was by him. When he said he wanted to poop, so I should, we should come. So I went to stand by him for about five minutes. He says he's not done. I was dizzy. I went to sit back down. My sister-in-law was with him. So Francis, I was sitting there on my phone. When my sister-in-law ran... I just had her running. I'm, I'm an emergency, Kofi, Kofi, Kofi. I just looked at her because I was just wondering what. And she said, Kofi, you need to come. So I followed, as I was walking, then I saw the doctors running towards his bed. And they pulled the, the, the curtain. So they just started pulling the curtains around his bed and started pushing. Like, you can't be here, you can't be here. We need, so I didn't mind them. I was standing there looking. Unfortunately, the curtain that also has issues with the rack was hanging halfway and I could see from my son's chest to his face area and I could just see his chest will rise and fall and it, like you know somebody who's struggling to breathe yeah. and then his eyes were just like that like just going around and then the last thing I saw in my mind as I was praying I, I was just telling God that I just thank God I can see his chest rise and fall then Francis I didn't see that happen again the next, next thing I saw was my son's eyes roll out. And then I started feeling numb. I was numb. I, I don't know how, but I managed to walk away from this. Thing. And I was crying. I was crying. My sister-in-law was hysterical. At the point, my brother had just come to join us. And 
I didn't know what to do. I started calling Dr. Abdallah. He wasn't there at the, at the moment. I didn't get a call. It was Dr. Baite who picked up and I said, Dr. Baite, Michael, Michael is done. He said, how? Just, I just left. I'm supposed to be coming back. How? How? So I, I, didn't, I don't even know. I just, you know, <sighs> Francis, I just saw doctors run from the ICU because they were wearing the lab, you know, coat and everything and they were running. 40 minutes. They were just trying to bring him back to life. And then one doctor had come early to tell us that um, we are trying to bring his heart back. We are trying to get a heartbeat. We have a pulse, but it's very faint. If we're able to get the heart back, that's good news. But if not, I said, if not. So my brother was asking, Doc, do we have a chance? If, you know, he says, I can't say anything now. So like 15 minutes later, mm -hmm. the same doctor walks to come and tell us that Michael is gone. And Francis, I said, I was shouting. I remember I was shouting. I said, no. He said, they said, you can't go there. I said, I can't. I said, I want to see my son. They said, you can't go there. I said, I want to see my son. I pushed them. I don't know how they pushed them. Everybody went out of my way and I ran to the bed and I saw my son lifeless. He was lifeless. And they had this thing, I think, you know, the, the machine, the defibrillator. They yeah. don't have one. Or the one that they were trying to use is something really old. I think they have to pump on or something like that. And so they had put that in his mouth with plaster all around his mouth. And that's what I went to meet. And I was just looking at my son. And I was trying to, I was trying to tell him to wake up, Dad, come. And I wanted him to wake up. So that was the conversation. That was what I was telling him. That's what I remember. That's what I remember the next minute. So what I do is I'll sit by him, go back to the waiting area, come back to look at my son and talk to him. Go back the third time when I came, they had wrapped him up. They had wrapped him up. They had wrapped him up like, oh God. And there was this plaster on there that had his name, Francis. And they put D-O-D. Date of death. I mean, it was because I told them, I said, look, because when I called my bishop, he said, you know what? Don't let them take him to the mortuary. He will wake up. Kofi would wake up. Don't let them take him to the mortuary. And I told them, I told Dr. Banka, I said, I said, Bishop, because Dr. Banka knows me. I said, Bishop, Bishop, Bishop says, don't take him. Don't take him to the mortuary. Don't take him to the mortuary. I don't know. Dr. Banka just asked them to take me away. Because they needed to take him from the ward. Okay. Emma, please hold on. Hold on. Hold on for me for just a second. Um, you're watching State of Affairs here on GH1 Television. Emma is telling us a story of how he, she, she lost a son at the Kolobu Teaching Hospital. We'll go for a break. We'll be right back to conclude on this matter. <laughs> Yo, Nana. Shut up, let just let me ride, you know. Yeah, the things I've done for this girl, pal. Who old that I be like me? And they carry goods for my bubble to Kaneshi. Catch up with family and friends like never before. Just pay for only the first minute of your call and pay absolutely nothing for the rest of your call. See, Amanda has left me. Huh? You know the most painful part? See? I thought you left my hand, though. Thank you. This is my last hope. Amanda has left me, oh. See, bro, it's a Fakushi I left me, but you also. Plus, you also get 50 megabytes a day just for your first call. Could you, Charlie? Amanda left me, oh. Yes, you made you carry load. Oh. Dial star 550 hash to subscribe to MTN Free After One today because we're good together. Amanda, we're good together. Terms and conditions apply. Alomo bites. If you do me no chini, and that's why you're authentic. Anio, any interview? Alomo, 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 alomo. Yeah, I'm from my NG, yeah. Me dey act in park with some alomo, alomo. Yeah, show me alomo now, sis and girl. Yeah, go to say ya, yeah, yeah, do say ya. Yeah, I 
Alo mo betes e di 20 years de kaim repa kroji. Numnu nyansem wan toma ni pa wun in fie du watre. En sesa pem fonum. FDR hivye se jwe di enkra to yi mo ajia tu mse ye. Alo mo ya. Alo mo. Authentically African. Everyone needs something. Sometimes, they become person you wish you can just get a grip as soon as possible. And you will get caught with so many questions of the how, where, and when. No need to bother any longer. My name is Mama Pregi. I am here to solve all your urgent needs. Check my swag. Visit my website now at www.mamapregimarket.com and you will find all range of products, food items, mother care, and baby items that will just suit what you need to buy or sell with a simple click. Call us on 030-2549-813 or 050-4709-463. Download the app on Google Play Store and Apple Store and Mama Preggy Delivery will be at your doorstep with your order. Mama Preggy, a time limit. I woke up this morning. Nothing wakes me up better than a cup of cowbell coffee. Delicious coffee aroma. Mmm. How can you forget your lines again? I'm sorry, sir, just that it tastes really good. Cowbell coffee! Enjoy the delicious creamy coffee taste of three in one cowbell taste coffee. It love oh, it's a beautiful day. Oh. Waiting. <laughs> cowbell coffee. Oh, taste it love it. Oh. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. You're welcome back. You're watching State of Affairs here on GH1 Television. I'm Franz Abba. And tonight we're looking at the state of our healthcare system in the country. What it looks like, what it is, and what we have to do to fix it. Uh, Kulilia Maselume is my guest tonight. She is a mother who's just lost a 13-year-old son. So full of life. I like to call him Angel Michael, who's lost his life after two successful surgeries. Now, I'm sure by now you've seen the and this, and this is a very difficult question to ask you. Seen the cause of death? I have, Francis. What does um, it say? Can you share? Yeah. Um, that's, and that's, that, that's the reason I, I still insist that um, the doctors didn't fail us and that it was the system that did. Um, because um, the coroner's report stated that he died from a bilateral pulmonary embolism, which mm. means that there was a clot or well, there were clots that traveled from his leg into his lungs. Now, the bilateral means that both lungs were choked with a clot. And you ask a doctor, one doctor, I remember when she had said, what are the odds? Usually, you probably have one lung for both lungs. Yeah. I mean, that's what happened. And, and I, I remember when I had the report and I called Dr. Abdallah and I asked him why, because they had just turned him to change his diaper. Yeah. When he said, the way you turned me, my heart, my heart. And then he went into a cardiac arrest. Wow. So, um, Abdullah says, yes. Um, so what happens is the clots were forming in his leg and were moving into that area. So at the point where they lifted him, it shot straight into his lung. Yeah. And I asked him how or why. So shouldn't we have turned him? He said, no, hold on a second. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame the nurses for turning him because... Even if he had moved his leg, it would have, it would shut, have up anyway. shut up anyway. So what, what had to be done was he had to still be in the ICU to be monitored for like a week. But he, but he couldn't be there. He couldn't be there because those monitors would pick up that there's clotting beginning. So then they are able to immobilize the patient so that they don't move their, their legs. Or then they, st then they start administering okay. medication. Okay. Let me, let me speak to Dr. Abdullah now. Dr. Hadi Abdullah has made time to join us uh, here on the show. Doc, thank you for making time to join us. Amas told us a very harrowing story of losing the son after all the hard work you and your team did with the two successful operations. For you, since she's told us the full story, talk to me about 
what is fundamentally wrong with our healthcare system, starting off with where you work at Kolibu? Yeah, um, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Um, I wish to state that pulmonary embolism is quite uncommon uh, in children. And uh, Michael's case was very special. And it was so because of the brain tumor he had and then the weight that he had came. And so it was something that we expected, as she mentioned, that we even started the blood thinning yeah. on the morning of the surgery. Uh, you may be unable to prevent even uh, the pulmonary embolism from happening, but when it happens, how to manage it is a big problem. I have seen people survive pulmonary embolism, which is one of the common causes of uh, cardiac death, uh, sudden death. But I've seen people survive it in, for example, very worst one in cardiothoracic uh, center. And if one, once you, you pick it up and the patient, you start the patient on high dose of the blood thinness that we had started him on in the morning. In this case, once you make the diagnosis, you must then initiate him on high doses of it to try and break the clot in the lung. But what he needs is also oxygenation. Mm -hmm. And it means that within that short time, probably was in the ICU, as the mother said, we could have easily intubated him, give him the oxygen or ventilate him, whilst you try to give that high dose of uh, medication that, that uh, he needed. Doc, I don't mean to cut you. With, with what you just said, a thought just hit me. I've lost my sister and my father in the last 11 years. My sister 10 years ago, my father 3 years ago, both from pulmonary embolism. And on both occasions, they were at sidewalk, not at the ICU. Could they have been saved? Yeah, uh, yeah. on the sidewalk, currently, looking at the way we have run our healthcare system, not just Kolehu, but throughout the country, if you visit most of our hospitals, we, we do not have the necessary monitors to be able to pick up these things when they happen. One of the main things that you pick up, especially with pulmonary embolism, is a fast uh, decreasing level of oxygenation. It, it gives you an indication that, no, there's something wrong with the respiratory system or oxygen supply. Okay. And once you know that these patients are at risk, you can start them on, on cleansing or or what we call a uh, heparin, okay. which is a blood thinner. Okay. If the patient is not breathe, uh, breathing very well, once you have the facility, the emergency facility, of course, the best would have been an ICU. You can easily then intubate the person. You can intubate the person quickly, get the person on a vent, or ventilate the person even with oxygen. Once you have the tube in there very quickly, you, oxy you oxygenate the person. You are able to pump some oxygen. You will not get life. Okay. like hundred percent, but mm. you you expect it to have increased to an appreciable level to oxygenate the, the rest of the organs and keep the patient alive whilst okay. you gradually break down the clot. Okay, so to and just let's do the be because of time. Of our Doc, sorry, because of time, I'm I'm really on, on a solid yeah. share. What are the key things that we need to fix right now? The key things that are most important right now for our healthcare system. Yeah, I I think that. Right now, as, as citizens of this country, we must recognize the fact that it is not normal to have a neurosurgical ward or any other ward in this country, not to have monitors by the best, best side of the patient, especially so for patients who have undergone surgery. You need monitors. The patient must have more. You don't need to move the patient to an area of monitor. And secondly, we must make sure that we fix AEDs on the ward. All our wards, not just the neurosurgery unit, but all wards in Kolebu and many of our hospitals. And in fact, even if you have gyms, you know, places that people indulge in cardiac activities, uh, gyms, we should have AED. So it, it, is, it is a shame that most of our hospitals do not even have these defibrillators. Thirdly, I would say that 
our ICU situation is to be fixed. It is unacceptable for neurosurgery to be done without a recovery ward. Okay. It I'm is out of time, doctor. The one, one bed ICU for neurosurgery is unacceptable. Wait. Your unit has only so, one bed. So to summarize, we need the money test. We need the we need to make sure that our CU is fixed so that our post op cases can survive. Okay. We will have to leave it here for now. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I thank you for joining us. We just might have to do a part two of this, but thank you for joining us, Dr. Hadi Abdullah, and for joining us. Thank you. Um, Amma, thank you for joining us and sharing your story. But what would be your last word to us? Going through this, this, this very difficult experience, what do we have to do to fix our healthcare system? We just have to hold those who are accountable to make sure that nobody goes through this anymore. There are too many people dying in Kolebu. There are too many people dying in other hospitals and in other places because we just don't have these machines and for the doctors to be able to work with. We have the expertise. We, they don't have the equipment they need to save lives. They cannot do everything. The doctors cannot do everything. We don't have basic equipment. Beds. And beds. Monitors. Monitors. Defibrillators. The ICU. We don't have a fully functioning ICU in Kolibu, apart from the, that place that has four beds. With just one bed allocated to the neuroscience unit. Francis, we need to change it. Look, we need to step up. We need to hold them accountable. We've, this Kolibu issue has been talked about for so long. It's been talked about for so long. If, and if something had been done about it back then, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't have lost my son. It's time we stop talking about things and then leave it to breathe. There should be no breather. We need to step up our game and make sure that we hold them account. They need to tell us when and how. So we, they, they, we need to have timelines. We can raise monies for other things. We should be able to raise monies to, 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 um, to, give, to give citizens better health systems and health care. Okay. That'll be your final word, and I, and I thank you for joining us, Kulilia Maselome. Also, we heard from Dr. Hadi uh, Abdullah. He's a neurosurgeon uh, at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. That'll be for us for State of Affairs tonight. I'm Francis Aban. Remember, there's a lot of work we have to do in fixing the country. Thanks for watching.